You are in the middle of nowhere. You can feel sunshine on your face and the warm wind going through your hair. Deep inside you feel overwhelming happiness and peace. Everything is as it should be. Shock advised. Stand clear. And suddenly you wake up on the back of an ambulance and your chest hurts. It's called ROSC. Let's talk about it. My name is Alex Hepner and this is Group Call. The problem with ROSC is not even that we don't expect it. The problem with ROSC is that the best practice guidelines lack clarity about what we should do when our patient comes back from the very long journey. <laughs> Let's fix it. Let's structure post ROSC care using evidence-based medicine and I promise that you'll be surprised with our findings. Stand clear. Traditionally, to detect ROSC, we use fingers to palpate the central arteries for presence or absence of pulse. The problem is that this method doesn't really work. Since 1996, when this famous study was published, we know that only between 10 to 15% clinicians can correctly assess absence or presence of the pulse in cardiac arrest patients. For 26 years, we know that the method doesn't really work and we still commonly use it. I have no idea why, but I know that it will change very soon because already all of the medical guidelines in the world suggest using combined methods, so palpation and something else. The most common suggestion is to check ETCO2 readings. Remember, a properly ventilated patient with a good quality CPR should have ETCO2 of 2 kPa. In ROSC, you will see a spike of ETCO2, which should soon stabilize from 4 to 5 kPa. This spike will happen even before a carotid pulse can be detected, so this is more sensitive and reliable tool than palpation. You may ask, but what if my patient is not tubed or IGELT, I was just using a BVM? You can still use an ETCO2 sensor between BVM and your mask. Works good. Far better than ETCO2 check would be point of care ultrasound. The sensitivity has been confirmed in many clinical trials and you can get a reliable result in approximately 5 seconds. There are also some research papers to suggest the use of near-infrared spectroscopy, also known as NIRS. This non-invasive technology monitors cerebral blood oxygenation and apparently can detect ROSC in less than 5 seconds without the need to stop CPR. The first trials already been published, check this one out. Stand clear. We don't move our post-ROSC patients for 10 minutes, right? But do you know why? There is actually a really good article uh, about that in Acute and Critical Care magazine. In a nutshell, all patients with ROSC are at high risk of rearrest due to the so-called reperfusion response. In cardiac arrest, the body is subject to global ischemia, which causes damage on the cellular level. When oxygenated blood comes back to the tissue, additional damage occurs, like altered calcium homeostasis and mitochondrial dysfunction. This process may take hours, but the biggest risk takes place in the first 10 minutes, therefore we don't want to move the casualty as we can easily miss the moment of eventual deterioration. So take your time to thoroughly execute your post ROSC checks. You will be surprised, but some checks done too early can be highly inaccurate. Do you want to know which ones? Stay tuned. In your post ROSC assessment, you should utilize your well-known C, A, B, C, D, E approach, but don't, I mean don't, skip the first letters. Clinicians tend to ignore checking for a new cath hem in uh, medical patients because they don't expect any blood to appear. Whilst actually, you may see cath hem post ROSC in medical patients, just to mention causes of cancer or maternal cardiac arrest with new onset of postpartum hemorrhage. I know, they don't teach this on uni. I know. Stand clear. During the cardiac arrest, you most likely already secured the patient's airway, so now it's time to recheck whatever you have used. Is it properly inserted and secured? Does the patient tolerate it? Are there any secretions to be suctioned? There's an urban myth uh, circulating that you should not use suction on post-cardiac arrest patients because it may cause desaturation and hypotension. This is not true. This research paper states clearly that short-term suction in the field won't cause any Issues. It also states that the myth originates from deep sedation combined with prolonged suction, usually performed uh, on ICU in the uh, first 24 hours, rather than our short-term suction in field. There's one more thing that no one tells you. If your patient is tube, you should check the pressure of the cuff. Overinflated cuff of the ET tube can cause massive problems, including the patient's death. If you want to know more, please watch this video. I will uh, leave the link in the description below. I hope you're ready for the next step, because it's going to blow your minds. 
Stand clear. Start with rechecking ETCO2 and listen to the patient's chest. You want nice bilateral air entry. If you can hear only one side and your patient is tubed, most likely the tube is inserted too deeply. Patient's height times 0.1 plus 4. That's the formula you should follow for the uh, tube's depth. Not the stupid 21-23 rule. But unilateral chest sounds can also mean spontaneous tension pneumothorax. Yes, you can see it in some non-traumatic patients or if you're trying to listen over the defibrillator part. And now comes the biggest surprise. For ages, we've been trained to give our post rosc patients 100% oxygen. Great, but the idea of 100% oxygen is not supported by any clinical data, okay? We just assume that it's good for the patient. However, systematic reviews uh, of compelling experimental data indicate that the administration of 100% oxygen can create hyperoxic levels, which may lead to neurological injury and worse clinical outcome. This concept is not new. I found interesting Finnish trial from 2006 concluding that the patients ventilated with 30% oxygen during the immediate post-resuscitation period had acceptable arterial oxygenation. Later, two big independent trials exploring reoxygenation of cardiac arrest victims started in 2016 and 2018. One was called EXACT, that was an Australian project, and the second one was called REOX2, American study. Unfortunately, both have been delayed by COVID, but we are expecting to get the results anytime soon. Takeaway point, avoid hyperoxygenation, maintain physiological levels of ETCO2. Don't go yet, almost every clinical study, including this, strongly suggests putting your post-ROSC patient on ventilator. And you know what? That kind of makes sense, especially if you want to avoid hyperoxygenation and hyperventilation. For colleagues who use sophisticated ventilators, SIMV mode is what you want to set on your machine. For all those who use good old Parapac 300 Delta, just throw it away. <laughs> You want to set CMV demand with a peak pressure alarm set to 40, 10 breath per minute, avoid hyperventilation, and a tidal volume of 6 to 8 mils per kilogram of ideal body mass. You calculate of an ideal body mass by deducting 100 from the patient's height. Simple. Ah, I almost forgot. Yes, you can mechanically ventilate a patient on an IGEL. They don't need to be tubed. Stand clear. You want to check both peripheral and central pulse for its quality and quantity. Checking CRT and a blood pressure is also a good idea. However, do not set your monitor for too frequent checks, as blood vessels squeezed too often by the BP cuff may give you an inaccurate reading. American Heart Association suggests minimum 5 minutes interval. And now time for 12 feet ECG, right? So before you actually put your dots on the patient, look at your watch and check how long ago your patient got rosk. Why? Because according to PEACE study, the acquisition of the 12-feet ECG too early after ROSC can misleadingly lead to the diagnosis of STEMI. According to the authors, the result of the ECG is 60% more accurate for acute occlusion when it's delayed 8 minutes post ROSC. Stand clear. You want to check the pupils for response to light and you want to check glucose levels and maintain those at 6 to 10 millimoles per liter as hyperglycemia following ROSC is associated with increased mortality and worse neurological outcomes. You also want to expose your patient's body in search of any additional signs and symptoms like rashes, patches and so on, so on, so on. And as we discuss exposure, the question now uh, arises, should we keep our patient warm or cold. In other words, what the hell should be temperature management like? The answer is between 32 and 36 uh, degrees maintained with passive cooling only. Giving cold fluids to prevent pyrexia is contraindicated and associated with many, many side effects. And that's where basically all guidelines stay the same. Why we even think about cooling our patients down? Because in 2002, Two randomized controlled trials were published and both found improvement in the patient subject to mild hypothermia in post rosc care. But later, two large projects were conducted, TTM trial by Nielsen in 2013 and TTM2 trial by Dankiewicz in 2021, and those studies did not confirm findings from 2002. What we found out, though, is that pyrexia is devastating for post-cardiac arrest patients. And let it be takeaway point. Normal thermia is good, avoid extremes of temperature. The last question I wanted to answer was about medications in ROSC. Should we be giving prophylactic anticonvulsants? Is adrenaline clinically superior to noradrenaline? Is really combination of noradrenaline and dobutamine clinically superior to adrenaline, which is associated with transition lactic acidosis? 
but I found so many interesting details that I promised to cover it in the next video. Meanwhile, I hope you enjoyed this episode. My name is Alex Hepner and this was Group Call.